folks. This is Dr. Emily Sherning with AR here with an up-to-date climate outlook for all of our friends in Vermont. You all have been experiencing such terrible flooding lately. We saw major floods in Vermont towards the end of July. And in August, the state expects to experience more flooding rain, more flooding drenching rain. Vermont is really feeling it right now. And, and I admire Vermont. I have to say there are so many ways that Vermont has put in the work to sustain a local economy and a local food system. Burlington, Vermont has really worked to build housing capacity. Burlington is a community that wants to be ready for the changes that are coming and that wants to be able to take people in. Let's take a look at the updated federal projections to see if we have any more clarity on where this flooding threat that we know Vermont is experiencing that has been widely projected to get worse. Let's see if we're gonna be able to find out where the flooding is most likely to continue to occur and what other risks may be facing the state. I know we're all concerned about how intense the rains have been this summer. Let's see if we can get a window into if there are lower risk areas in the state. All of the resources that I'm gonna use in this outlook are publicly available. You can go to my website and go over to the resources tab. And you'll be able to find our original visualizations, which are powered by federal publicly available data sets in the NCA5 report. This is where you'll be able to find most of the figures that I use is directly from the NCA5. The way that we use the NCA5 data sets to make it more user friendly and relatable in the American resiliency visualizations, a lot of the times we're able to show side by side of what's going on at 1.5C which is where we are now. As you can see in this current update for sea surface temperature, with 2024's line being just slightly under the line for 2023 right now, we're still in a really weird place on climate. We didn't expect to be at 1.5C for over a year running average in 2024. And it does make it particularly urgent to look at what changes are coming towards 2C. Because as you can see here, just at a glance, those changes are really big. We used to think that we'd hit 2C around 2050. Now it seems like it's probably going to happen sooner. A lot of people are now saying that in the 2030s, we need to be ready for 2C. Makes it important to know what's coming and look ahead as we can. I want you to be doing your own research. I want you to be able to confirm everything I report without too much work on your end. I want you to feel like you can access these resources and drill down to where your community is and get localized projection information. But if you don't feel confident with that, you should get in touch with me and I'll help you. At American Resiliency, we use the fifth national climate assessment data and figures because they do represent the highest consensus climate science available. Your tax dollars paid for the development and review of these resources and you deserve access to the information. As a matter of congressional mandate, there's no direct federal funding for communication to the public about the national climate assessment. That's why I founded American Resiliency we're the only nonprofit focused on communicating this important information to the public, and we run on your donations. Checking out the heat projections for Vermont, you look good. Here in our wet bulb risk tool, which looks at the length of the potentially dangerous hot season and how it might change between 1.5 and 2C, we see very little change for Vermont between 1.5C, where we are now, and 2C. We see a couple of counties are picking up a small hot season increase. Let's poke into that with the total heat map. So this total heat map stacks data for all layers of increased heat in the NCA5, days over 95, days over 100, and 105. You don't have any of those extreme heat increases projected for Vermont. And if we pan over the counties, we can see that most counties in Vermont are looking at extremely small heat increases with just a handful of additional days over 95 projected for most of the state. With your typical July highs in the 80s, even a handful of days over 95 is going to be a change for the area. But at least your heat peak as we look towards 2C, it appears to be quite brief in the projections. And it is important to note again, we're not looking at additional days over 100 or over 105 projected for a typical year in Vermont at 2C. Heat is increasing, but it looks like a pretty tight cap on dangerous heat in Vermont's projections. If we look at figure 2.11 from the NCA5, we can focus in on nighttime heat projections. How many nights will it fail to cool off? And for Vermont, again, we see pretty good news. There is about an additional week of nighttime warming projected right along Lake Champlain, but for the rest of the state, it should be only a handful of additional nights above 70. 
giving people and other living things time to cool off at night, which is very important for health. So in terms of summer projected heat increases, this is a very mild level of change against the national landscape. That's something that Vermont has been counting on, continuing mild summers. And I'm glad to say we don't see anything in the updated NCI 5 projections that strikes against that hope. Looking at the winters, let's go back to 2.11. Here in the center of the figure, we can zoom in on loss of cold days, loss of days under 32. And we can see here this lighter color by Lake Champlain, where we might have seen a little bit more summer warming, but we see a little bit less winter loss. There, we're talking about two weeks less of winter, also in this little lighter region. For the rest of the state, it's about a three-week reduction in your cold season. So that's winter duration. The length of the cold season is going to be at least three weeks shorter, maybe only two weeks shorter in some parts of the state. But what we really need to think about in Vermont is cold intensity. And for that, we're going to go to figure 11.3. 11.3 looks at changes in plant hardiness zones, which are a good way to look at changes in winter lows. As you can see, this figure is enormous, but this is where the SNPs I'm going to go to now come from. Let's look at Vermont side by side for today and a 2C projection. This is a big change in your projected winter intensity. You're looking at a 10 degree lift in winter lows for much of Vermont. You are looking at maintaining winter lows below zero in the state, which you can see is not true as we move into New Hampshire or south into Massachusetts. So you're still cold, but it's not going to be the fierce cold, particularly in southern Vermont, that helped preserve distinctive cold adapted ecosystems. And I would certainly be concerned about continuing impacts on sugaring in the spring and on leaf color in the fall. Both of those are important cultural and practical events for the state. You know, the leaf tourism is a big business and sugaring is important from the home to the commercial level for many families in Vermont. So this is a lot to take in, but I think it's important to say, I don't know that we're talking about a full on winter disaster here, a level of winter change that would wipe out these important spring and fall traditions. In Vermont, you are looking to maintain a four season climate, a traditional four season climate, even if the winters won't be as cold. The winters in Vermont of 2C are projected to look and feel like the winters in Western Massachusetts were traditionally up till like 2010. So that's still a real winter if you've ever been down there in the winter. The color is pretty good down there in the fall. We're not talking about a total loss situation. We're not talking about as dramatic a shift in winters as we're seeing elsewhere right in the region, right in the Northeast. I want to contrast your projected winter change in Vermont with what we're going to see down in Connecticut, which Connecticut has a pretty nice climate outlook with good coastline preservation and good preservation of a mild summer. But there, we're seeing a move towards a Virginia-like winter in the projections. Big changes in the Northeast is what I'm saying, with Vermont showing relatively good temperature preservation year-round compared to neighboring states in the region. Let's look at precipitation now. I know this is our big concern for Vermont. In figure 210 for Vermont, we see that you are projected to get more. That's not a surprise. The whole state is in this band looking at like up to 10% additional precipitation. What's really critical for understanding the flood risk to Vermont is the information that we can pull out of this figure, figure 2.12 from the NCA5, which shows projected changes to precipitation extremes. Because when Vermont is flooding, it's often flooding directly from deluge type rains. And we're talking about very serious rains. We're talking about six, seven inch rains. And we could see more than that. It's terrible to think about what we could see more than that. So looking across these figures, I look for repeating patterns to help us see where's the danger going to be strongest. So I'm zoomed in here on one of the panels just to show where there are repeating patterns, which there are repeating patterns for particularly dark, severe deluge type rain in this northeast part of Vermont, where we are currently seeing such terrible flooding. And we do see it in the projections conserved as well for around Lake Champlain. We see an area where we don't expect as much serious flooding deluge type rain here. And we see areas where there is less of an increase in rain projected across southern Vermont. I want to share this Vermont level resource here. Well, you'll be able to see that these updated projections in the NCA5 showing higher risk for some communities than others in Vermont is something that the state is on top of. This is not unexpected trends that we're seeing and Vermont is getting ready for the floods. 
Vermont is working to get statewide floodplain regulations in place to identify vulnerable structures, vulnerable communities, and vulnerable infrastructure. If you're in Vermont or you're curious about Vermont as a climate destination, because it's all around climate preservation, it does look really great. This is an important resource to see if you're in an area where this sort of serious flooding threat is expected. Flooding is the challenge Vermont is going to face. It's not a change from the NCA4 to the NCA5. Vermont's been preparing for this. And now that we're at 1.5C, we're really starting to see what this flooding is like and how much it sucks. And we're looking at it getting worse from here on out. We know the places where the threat of flooding deluge is likely to be more serious. We know where the threat is less severe. Taking a peek on Google Maps, this is an area where we're seeing a lot of flooding is around St. Johnsbury. We also expect, and people are preparing for flooding down in Burlington along Lake Champlain. We expect this area here to be pretty good, pretty resilient against that major flooding threat. And as you get down into the Green Mountain National Forest, I'm glad to say that we expect to see relatively low deluge type flooding threat throughout this portion of the state. If you are tied to that Green Mountain National Forest, everything is lining up pretty good for stability for your land there. I'm really rooting for you all. You know, being aware of where you are in the floodplain and building resilience against water is the big challenge facing Vermont. Some people would say that's a reasonable trade-off for a four-season climate with a cool summer. But some of those people have never been in a serious flood, and they don't have a concept of how unstoppable and transformative a serious flood can be for a community. I would not anticipate flood insurance continuing to be available with the way the home insurance market is changing. Insurance companies are pulling out of states coast to coast. We've seen insurance markets retreating due to flood risk in the St. Louis area in the Midwest. I think it's worth keeping in mind that this is likely to be a trend as you think about your future in Vermont. If I were you in a small town in Vermont, especially in the more stable regions, like up in the center north there, I look at communities in that region on a satellite map, and I don't know that you want to grow that much. You'd have to grow into the woods where you're going to invite the risk of wildfire or you'd have to sacrifice agricultural land, which is also a bad move when we're looking at a future where local food systems are likely to be more important. If you're interested in looking at some content with local food systems in Vermont, one of the AR draft readers, which thanks guys for all of the work that you do, recommended Ben Falk's channel, especially some of his earlier long form pieces to help you get an idea of the potential and the work that is currently being done in the state to cultivate a rich localized food system. In Vermont, finding ways to protect your boundaries, to protect your agricultural land, and to continue to support your local food system, all of those are gonna be critical to your resilience. And you're important. I wanna show you in figure 4.3 from the NCA5 here, we can see the ensemble modeling, the range of precipitation scenarios for the US in a warming world. And you can see that Vermont is in a lower variable region than many states. If you look at my place in Iowa, you can see in the ensemble modeling, we could get real wet or real dry. In Vermont, you're looking more at a range of real wet or just regular wet. So if the U.S. sees a big drought cycle, which you could kind of visualize here, you in Vermont would be in a potential area of stability. That would make your agricultural potential more important than ever. Preserving agricultural land in the Northeast where we could keep production up, even in a major drought cycle that could take out Midwest production for a few years. It's important to our national food system. It's important for us all. Vermont, I'm glad to see little change in these projections for you. Just more clarity on where we expect more heat to come in and when, and more clarity on where we do expect these flooding deluge type rains to hit most often. And we're getting a better idea of what this is gonna feel like, this flooding how intense these storms are gonna be. I'm sure that if you're in this state, you've been looking at your place, thinking about how it could be impacted by flood, even if it hasn't been yet. You gotta know there's a lot we can do to build resilience, especially as we gain confidence that we're dealing with one primary threat. That's not the case everywhere. In Texas, you got like five different life-threatening factors heading to the state at once. In Vermont, we got to look at floods. Vermont is fighting the good fight, and I hope you all stay the course. I know you're feeling it right now. This has been a really hard summer for Vermont. Anyone who has looked to Vermont as a possible destination, 
You can see what the fight is. You can see where the struggle is going to lie. There are challenges ahead, but not every part of Vermont is likely to see the type of flooding we're seeing on the news. There are many places in Vermont that look quite excellent from an all around perspective. I'm wishing you and your communities all the best all throughout the state. You've got an outlook that's good for the long haul on a broad range of factors. You've got a good future to build in Vermont. Let's get ready. Folks, thanks for watching. And I wanna thank everyone in the AR community for your contributions that are keeping this nonprofit going. If you wanna donate, there's a link on the about page of our YouTube channel or on the top bar of our website, www.americanresiliency.org. I'm very grateful to our donors, to our volunteers, to everyone spreading the word online, and especially to everyone doing the work on the ground. Thanks for getting ready with me and talk with you again soon.